Okay, we're in Deuteronomy chapter 30, and uh, let's pray before we get started. Um, Father, we uh, again want to come before you and uh, ask that you'd have your hand on us as we're going through your word. Um, Lord, we thank you that you're a God who knows the end from the beginning. And actually, um, we're going through a, a couple of chapters here that are uh, pretty amazing in the fact that you laid out the whole history of Israel before it ever took place. And uh, the reason that you are um, letting these people know these things is specifically because you know where their hearts are at, you know where they're going to go, and you're trying to warn them off. And so, Lord, we, we just pray that as we're going through it, that um, you would be speaking to our hearts too. You know our hearts, you know where we're going, and there are times when you um, really uh, indeed need to warn us off. And so, God, we just pray that you bless the time, that you'd speak to us, and that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Last week we were, we were going through and um, God had just gone through in uh, chapter 28 and talked about um, the history of Israel in advance. And then in chapter 29, what God does is he ratifies the covenant uh, with the uh, children of Israel who came out of the wilderness. And in chapter 30, you know, in, in that whole section there, God had warned them that what they're going to do is they're going to end up walking away from him. And when we get to chapter 30, um, chapter 30 is all about how God restores Israel. And so, you know, like I was saying in my prayer, this is actually one of the most um, interesting, actually, it's one of the most amazing passages that you have in the whole Bible. Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30, 31. They're just amazing because what God does, uh, again, he lays out the whole history of Israel before they ever even get started. They don't even get, get into the land before he tells them exactly what they're going to do and exactly how they're going to end up uh, in, the, in the sense of uh, their rebellion against God and then how God's going to bring them back into the land. And you know what? We're right in the middle of the last part of that where God is bringing them back into the land and he's beginning to turn the hearts of Israel back towards himself. And so um, this actually blows me away. This is one of those passages that I'll refer to when I'm, when I'm talking to people about how I know that the Bible is the word of God. Um, the, the book of Deuteronomy is not something that um, you can uh, kind of counteract by saying that it was written way late or anything. Because we know that it was written before the time of Jesus, right? Because Jesus quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. We know that it was written at least 200 years before the time of Jesus because it's put into a Greek translation of the Old Testament that's called the Septuagint. Um, there are all kinds of references to Deuteronomy. Now, what a, a liberal scholar will tell you is that the book of Deuteronomy was written um, after the, or at the time that the Jews came back from Babylon. And so the Jews came back from Babylon, uh, oh, just about 400 BC. And so if it was written 400 BC, it doesn't matter because all the stuff that God talks about in the, in the passages, as far as the nation of Israel being dispersed into all the nations of the world and being brought didn't happen until, until, uh, the, until, um, after the birth of Christ. And so again, what you have is, um, you have a whole set of prophecies that unbelievers can't get away from, no matter what they do to squirrel with the book of Deuteronomy. Now, I don't think the book of Deuteronomy was written after uh, the return um, from Babylon. It was written by Moses, and it's really clear. Um, there's all kinds of evidence for that, and we talked about that when we first started the book. But again, you see what I mean? I can give the, I can give the liberal critics, I can give the liberal scholarship Every, every, th every point that they want with the book of Deuteronomy, and I can still prove that it's God's work. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, a, a pretty cool thing. So in chapter, in chapter 29, uh, chapter 28 and 29, he's warned them that what they're going to do is they're going to end up walking away from him. In chapter 30, chapter 30 is all about how God's going to bring it back. So let's go, go through and read it real quick. Verses 1 through 5, it says, Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, 
From there, the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will pro prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And let's read verse 6 too. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And then the passage goes on. And, and again, um, what God's doing is he's telling them their future. The, really the point of uh, verses one through five is that repentance will bring you home. It's always something to keep in mind. You know, there are these times when we walk away from the Lord, whether we do it um, uh, in an overt manner in the, in the sense of we just, you know, stop going to church, stop reading our Bible, go out and start doing the things that, the, that people do in the world, that kind of stuff. Or whether we do it in our heart in the sense that we get distance from, distant from the Lord. One of the things that we always need to remember that, is that repentance will bring you home. All I have to do is turn. All I have to do is stop going the way that I'm going, turn it around, bring it by, right back, and Jesus will be there to receive me. You know the, you know the story of the um, prodigal son, right? That's actually the story of the faithful father is what the title of that story should be. Because the prodigal son takes everything the father gave him, basically wastes it all, takes all, and, and you know, it's a, it's a whole story about despising the things that your father gave to you in the context of that culture. Everything that the father did for him was unusual. Didn't it usually happen that way? Everything that, that the son asked for was something that was um, insulting. And the father gave it to him. And then he took off and he wasted the whole thing. And while he was in the far country, he lost all his friends because he didn't have any money anymore. And then, he, then he, the Bible says that he came to himself. Jesus said this. He came to himself. When he came to himself, he said to himself, um, uh, even the servants in my father's house are treated better than I am. I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to say to him, Father, I don't deserve to be even, uh, I don't deserve to be your son. Just make me one of your servants. And so he turns around, he comes back, and what happens is the father's watching for him. And when he sees the son coming over the horizon, he gets up and he starts running. Again, that's something that dads didn't do back then. It was something that um, was, uh, you know, it just, it just wasn't something that was done, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was dignified. So fathers didn't run. Um, and yet the father runs to him, the son gives his speech, the father ignores the speech and says, let's have a barbecue, kill a fatted calf, let's have a barbecue, get some sandals from my son's feet, where's the ring? And rings represent sonship and um, the slaves went barefoot. And so what he's doing is he's restoring uh, the sonship to him. And what you see in that passage, what Jesus is doing when he's teaching that is he's showing the father's heart. And what God many times is doing is waiting for people to stop, waiting for them to turn around, waiting them, for them to come back. And when they do, he comes running. And that's just how the Lord is. And that's exactly the same thing that um, God is saying in this passage. Repentance will always bring you home. And so... Um, when God speaks to these people, God knows the history of Israel before it comes to pass. And that's another thing that's important. One of the cool things about God is that when God picked me, when, when God brought me into, um, into his kingdom, into his family, he knew exactly what I was going to do. He knew what I was going to do a year after I got saved. He knew what I was going to do three years after I got saved. He knew what I was going to do 10 years after I got saved, 20 years, 30 years. Now we're, on, now we're in 40 years and better. He's always known what I was going to do when I got saved, and he picked me anyway. That's how I look at it. He picked me anyway. And that's what he did with these people, too. That's what he did with you. You're, there are these times when you get yourself into a big, fat mess, and you're like, I don't, you know, I don't even know if I'm saved. I don't, I don't, I don't see how God could, could even love me. I don't, I don't, I don't understand how he could put up with me. The, the, the deal with God is he looks at you and he knows what he got. Nobody fooled God when you came along. No, nobody fooled him. You didn't fool him. Nobody else fooled him. Somebody didn't come up to, to God and say, Hey, I got this friend of mine. You should know him. He's a good pal. You know, he can come over to your house. You know, that kind of, it doesn't happen that way. God knows exactly who you are when you come and he still takes you. And so you keep that in mind when you're, when you're blowing it, because that's what, um, uh, that's what God did with the people of Israel. So he knows the history of Israel before it, ha it comes to pass. That's important. In verse 1, he says, it's going to come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing. They're going to get the blessing. 
And so we talked about that when we were in Deuteronomy 28. Um, the blessing uh, portion of that covenant, the place where you can really see it is during the, the reign of Solomon. And then he talks about the fact that the cursing is going to happen, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you. When it all comes to pass, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you. So not only is the blessing going to happen, the cursing is going to happen. And the blessing, again, took place during the reign of Solomon. The cursing is the rest of Israel's history, basically. They didn't have a whole lot of time where they were actually following the Lord. He talks about in this passage that Israel's going to be driven out of the land because of their disobedience. And when, when you look at what he says, they're not going to just be driven to Babylon. They're not going to be driven, just driven to Assyria. If you look in verse 4, he says, If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there, there the Lord uh, will gather you, and from there he will bring you. The Jewish nation is all over this planet. And so there, there are Jews. Um, I've got a friend who's a Jew from Iraq. Um, I, I've known people, you know, obviously we have Jews in every state in our country. There are Jews in, in uh, Canada. There are Jews in South America. There are Jews um, in Mexico. There's Jews in Central America. They are literally all over the planet. I don't know if there's Jews in China, but I imagine that there probably are. There's probably Jews in China. I imagine that there's Jews in Japan. They're, uh, they're everywhere on this planet, and they continue to be the Jewish nation. And that's one of the things, again, that God um, stated was going to be happening with the Jewish nation. They weren't just going to be going to Babylon. They weren't just going to be going to Assyria. They were going to go um, out into the farthest parts of heaven. That actually took place after the rejection of Christ. Um, during In the Old Testament, they were driven to Assyria, and that's the northern ten tribes, for the most part, were driven to Assyria, and then Oh, about uh, 120 years later, the southern tribe of Judah was taken to Babylon. And when they came back from Babylon, they didn't all come back. There was a large Jewish presence in Babylon, even during the time of Christ. And so um, Assyria and Babylon in the Old Testament, Old Testament, but when the Jews rebelled against the Romans, the Romans drove them into every nation on the planet. And that's where they've been for the last 2,000 years. It's only been um, within our lifetimes and actually uh, for some of us a little bit before our lifetime started that the Jews have actually come back to the, to the land of Israel. Um, this last week, President uh, Trump uh, recognized um, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And that was awesome. When I, when I heard about it, I was driving on the way to work, and I heard about it on the news, and I went, right on! <laughs> you know, it's about time. And one of the things that, that you're always worried about in a situation like that is um, what's going to happen with the rest of the world, and you know, uh, what are uh, the Muslims going to do? Are they going to cause a big ruckus and that kind of stuff? And there has been. There's been some riots that have taken place for about three days, and now they're all simmering down. Because Israel is the, is the land um, that God gave to the people of the Jews, and Jerusalem has always been the capital of Israel. Um, we've we've uh, basically recognized Jerusalem since 1995. We just haven't done anything about it. And so now he did that. Um, one of the things, though, that goes along with that is it may be another one of those things that drives the um, scenario that brings in the coming of Christ. You know, the coming of Christ has to come after the tribulation period, and the tribulation period starts off with a war. And that war is between the Jews and between a whole group of Muslims, and it looks like Russia too. And so some those are things that you need to be watching for when you're looking um, at things that are going on in the Middle East. Um, the return that the Bible talks about in this pa passage where God says, I'm going to bring you out um, from every nation under the, under the heavens and bring you back to the land— for the most part, that return is going to be taking place at the second coming of Christ. Um, and so that's something that we're looking forward to. When they return, one of the things that God requires from these guys is repentance. And again, when, when you look at the word repentance in the Bible, um, that word in Greek means that in my mind, I'm looking at where I'm going. I'm looking at the things that I'm doing, and I do a 180 in my head. I decide I'm not going to go this direction anymore. I'm going to stop and I'm going to go the other direction. You know, um, there are a lot of people who are sorry for the things that they've done. And a lot of times the reason that they're sorry is because they got caught. 
There's a difference between being sorry because you got caught and actually repenting. Remorse is when you're sorry for being caught. Repentance is when you're sorry enough to stop. And that's what God's looking for. He talks about the, the fact that they're going to return. The, the reason he's talking about them returning is because they've left. Same thing with us. God talks about returning. And the reason that he talks to us about returning is because we've left. Jesus in um, Revelation in chapter 2 was talking to the church at Ephesus. And basically he gave them a stellar report as far as how their church was going. There were people who were discerning. They were people who taught the word of God. Uh, they were people who were actually doing the things that God called them to. But he said, I have one thing, that, one thing against you. You've left your first love. He doesn't say you lost your first love. He said you left. You moved. And it's one of the things that we need to keep in mind as believers. I don't want to move. I just want to stay in the same place that I was when I first got saved in the sense that I'm in love with Jesus and I'm thankful for the things that he's done for me. So he talks about them returning. Uh, and they, the reason for that is because they've left. In verse 8, he says, You will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The reason he says obey there is because they're not. They've left. They're not obeying. And then um, in uh, both verse, uh, what is it, verse 3, and also in verse 6, he talks about these guys returning with all their heart and soul. Let, uh, read, let's, let's read verse 6. It says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And also the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you, and you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. So return, obey, and love God with all your heart and with all your soul. God wants an inward relationship versus an outward one. That's, what he, again, what he's looking for. And it's good stuff for us to keep in mind. God hasn't changed, not even one little bit, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He still expects the same things from us. And like I said, this ultimately, ultimately takes place at the second coming of Christ. Um, in Matthew 24, 31, this is actually a verse that gets confusing uh, for some people uh, because they don't know a lot about the Old Testament. Um, in Matthew 24, 31, it says, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Mark uh, 13, 27 is similar, and it says, And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest part of heaven, uh, from, from the par farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. It's exactly the same language that God uses here in verse 4. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you. And so when Jesus comes back at the second coming, there are a bunch of people in Israel who are Jews. But there are, there are Jewish people all over the world. In fact, most of the Jewish people on the planet live in New York City. There's more, there's more Jews in New York City than there are in Israel. And so um, when Jesus comes back, one of the things that he says is that he's going to gather the whole Jewish nation back to the land of Israel, and it's angels that are going to be going out and gathering them and bringing them back. As a matter of fact, in the book of Isaiah, um, in Isaiah chapter 60, 66, it talks about these people coming on carts and coming on horses. And, you know, it's like, it's like they're, they're getting to Israel any way that they can but they're coming to the land of Israel. They're coming back. Um, the reason it says carts and horses is because it's the end of the tribulation period. And by that time, all the infrastructure is wiped out. The Bible says that the, the cities of the nations fall. Uh, there's great earthquakes. Cities of the nations fall. And so, you know, whenever I think of the tribulation period, I think of uh, New York being in rubble. That's what I think of. I think of Los Angeles um, being in rubble. Think of Seattle being in rubble. All the, all the cities of the nations fall. And when you have earthquakes that are on the, uh, of the magnitude that the Bible talks about, where literally islands are disappearing and mountains are disappearing, what you're going to have is you're going to have a destruction of the, of the infrastructure that's so radical, you're not going to be able to drive anywhere. And, and so the Bible talks about these people getting to the land of Israel in any way that they can. Um, it's in, um, this return that the Bible talks about here is fulfilled in part by the modern return of the Jews. Did you know that the Jews were offered Uganda by the British? The British offered to give them the nation of Uganda. I just went to Uganda for the first time this last year. It's actually really beautiful. It's a really nice place. 
and uh, um, the Jews uh, were offered Uganda by the British. The Brit they turned it down, and um, uh, they uh, obviously got the land uh, of their ancestors over in what we call Israel nowadays. Nowadays, the first return of the Jews. Um, remember that they were sent off into Babylon. Um, in the first return of the Jews, um, that was to a state, talking about Israel, that was controlled by Persia. They weren't free, and they didn't fulfill the passage. Again, when you, when you look at this, um, let's start in verse 8. It says, uh, and you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey, obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if you return to the Lord, or if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul. And so he talks about bringing them back together as a nation. He talks about the fact that God is going to rule over them. Um, he talks about the fact that God is going to be blessing them. Um, he's going to give them the land that their fathers possessed, and they are going to possess it. They're going to be prospering and multiplying more than their fathers. And so that didn't take place under, under um, Persia, under the return uh, from Babylon, basically. The second return, the Bible talks about, and there is a second return. And so the first return was the return from Babylon. The second return is the one that we're seeing the precursors of right now, where the Jews are returning to Israel. There's a passage in Isaiah 11, 11 through 13. It says this, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, um, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. And so it's talking about places all over the Middle East. Assyria is north of Israel, Egypt is south of Israel, Pathros and Cush, uh, Cush is in, um, in Africa. I forgot to look up Pathros. I can't remember what that's at. Elam and Shinar are uh, in the area of Iraq and um, uh, over in Persia. Hamath and the islands of the sea, those are Gentile areas. It says he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, Judah shall not harass Ephraim. And what that's talking about, that last part about Ephraim and Judah, Ephraim was the northern nation. Judah was a southern nation. They had an issue in the nation of Israel that was like our north-south war in the Civil War, where the north was against the south, the south was against the north. The Jews had exactly the same thing, only they became two different nations. And so there was an antagonism between those two nations before they were sent off into, in, into captivity. When they come back, the Bible says in that passage in uh, the book of Isaiah, also says it in the book of Ezekiel. When they come back as a nation, they're not going to be two nations anymore. They're just going to be one nation. And again, that's exactly what happened. That's that's what that's what's happening in the time that we're living in. There's no there's there's no evidence at all of the Jewish nation being divided from the Jewish nation on any kind of level. They're back in the land, and they are unified. That's the second return. And it's the second return that is the last return that the Bible talks about. And again, it's happening in our time. Um, it talks about in this passage that God is going to um, turn them around. He's going to uh, circumcise their heart, verse 6. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Turn over to Ezekiel 36 real quick. Ezekiel chapter 36, check this out. You know, um, in the New Testament, Jesus, um, when he did the Last Supper, um, he gave us what was, what was called the New Covenant. And the New Covenant, um, we generally think of as being something that was given to the church, and that's where, that's where Jesus comes along and he, and he makes this relationship with us where he comes to live inside of us and, and we walk with him and, and he takes away our sin, all of that stuff, right? And so we think of that as a New Testament term. The New Covenant, New Testament, is, it's, the, uh, it's a synonym. New Testament and New Covenant, same kind of thing. But the New Covenant is, is something that comes out of the Old Testament. So 
in chapter 36, starting in verse 24, um, God says, For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. I will deliver you from your uncleannesses. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abomination. Not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. And that's called the new covenant, where God takes the stony heart out of the Jewish nation and he gives them a heart of flesh. He softens their heart. It says that he'll sprinkle clean water upon them and cleanse them and give them his Holy Spirit. You know, in the New Testament where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And he talks about the fact that um, uh, you need to be born of water and of the Spirit. You know that the only place in the whole Bible where water and the Holy Spirit are used in the same, in the same context is in this passage right here. What Jesus was talking about was the new covenant that God had, had promised to the nation of Israel. I'm going to, I'm going to, you need to be born of water and born of the Spirit. And so what the Spirit does is he comes and he cleanses you with clean water and he fills you and he empowers you to do the things that God called you to. It's the reason that Jesus said, you're a teacher of the, of, of Israel and you don't know these things. You don't know about the new covenant that God was going to do with the people of Israel. And so the covenant that we have, where we come into a relationship with God, he comes inside, cleans us from the inside out. That was something that was originally promised to Israel. And it's something that God's going to fulfill for them. There's, a, there's another um, passage that talks about the new covenant. In the book of Jeremiah, it says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, I will write it on their hearts, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And so God promises that he's going to bring them back. And when he brings them back, he's going to um, bless them under the new covenant. Again, verses 7 through 10 he says, also the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on all those who hate you and persecuted you. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord. Back in Deuteronomy 30. Um, again, obey the voice of the Lord um, and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand and all the fruit of your body and the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. See how he keeps emphasizing heart and soul? And again, what God wants is a heart that's soft towards him. All these things are going to come upon Israel as God said. These are the covenant blessings that God promised to the people of Israel. And their future is not only set in the terms of, of the fact that they were going to turn away from the Lord, their future is set in the fact that they are, there are going to be Israelis who turn to the Lord and God fulfills these blessings in them. God never gets rid of Israel, just like he never gets rid of the church, never gets rid of Israel. And so all these things are going to come upon the people of Israel, whether they obey or not, whether you have a group of people who right now are absolutely obeying God or not, God has said that these blessings are coming upon them. 
And so again, it's something to keep in mind. There is a, a teaching that's becoming popular again. It was something that the Roman Catholic Church taught from the time of Augustine all the way up until the Reformation. And it was that the Catholic Church replaced Israel. When the Reformation took place, the Reformers, they were good guys, and, and they returned to the teaching of the Bible. But what they re actually returned to was Augustinianism, which um, Augustine believed in salvation by faith um, through grace, or excuse, excuse me, salvation by grace through faith. Um, he, he believed um, that we needed to have a walk with God in which we were um, looking at the word of God, paying attention to what the word had to say. He was a great guy, but he was also a guy who believed that God had replaced Israel with the church. And so when the Reformation took place, basically all that happened was um, the modern church went back to Augustinian Christianity. And so they didn't go back to specifically what the Bible had to say about the Jewish nation. And so you have... Uh, you have uh, Protestant groups that believe that they are the fulfillment of the promises to Israel in the Old Testament. And so when you talk to Lutherans or you talk to Presbyterians or you talk to anybody who's of the Reformed persuasion, what they will tell you is that God got rid of Israel and he, and he replaced Israel with me. I'm the replacement for Israel. And so the church is something that replaces Israel. And again, that's something that caused all kinds of problems for the nation of Israel all the way through the Middle Ages and on into modern times. That is not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches is that Israel is in disobedience at this point, but God's going to turn them around. Um, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 11 are clear on this, that Israel's going to return. You get to the book of Revelation, same thing. It is clear that the Jewish nation returns. And what people try to do is they try to take the obvious references to the Jews in the book of Revelation and make them spiritual. They spiritualize them and start pointing them to, towards the church. And so the 144,000 are not 144,000 Jews. You'll pick up commentaries that say that's a, that's a spiritual number that's regarding you know, referring to the church. Jehovah's Witnesses famously go, we're the 144,000. Mormons go, we're the 144,000. The church goes, we're the 144,000. And God says the 144,000 are a bunch of Jews. That's what God says. And so God's going to turn this around and he's going he's to bring the Jewish nation back into a relationship with him. There is a revival going on in Israel right now. There, there's more Jews turning to, to Jesus right now than there has been um, in, uh, in actually centuries. And so it's a very cool thing. When you look at verses 11 through 20, you have a ratification of this covenant. God's making this covenant with the people of Israel. And this is where God goes, okay, here's the deal. You and me, we're, we're going to be tight here. Verse 11, he says, for this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you, uh, in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he's your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. And so God talks about the fact that you know, basically, verses 11 through 14 is, this is not rocket science, guys. This is, this is not some huge thing that, that you have to work up to. This is not something that you have to send off for. This is, not, this is not something that you have to be educated about. What God says is it's not far away. It's not something that's difficult. It's something that's near you. And specifically, he talks about the fact that put it in your heart. 
You know right from wrong. You know, you know what you're supposed to be doing. You know what you're not supposed to be doing. And so, um, you know, again, this is not rocket science. Verse 15 and 16, he talks about the fact that love brings life. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. And that was a promise to them. Guess what? Same thing with us. Exactly the same. I, I, I want to tell you a story. My son. My son went off to college. He's, uh, um, he just turned 19. And, and so um, he got out of school. He's, you know, he's done really well. Um, he ended up going to, um, uh, what's that called, Bob? Running start. He did running start. And so he got his AA coming out of high school. And so I was, you know, it's just crazy awesome because I, I don't know whose son he is. Because, because you know, he would, he would literally come home. He had a girlfriend and everything, man. He would come home and he would go down into the basement. I go, where are you going? He goes, he'd go, I'm going to, I got to go do my homework. He was always doing that. He would take off and he'd go into his room and he'd go, I got to get my homework done. And so he'd go down and get his homework and homework done. And so he ended up graduating with an AA from, uh, uh, Columbia Basin, and so then he wants to go over to Bellevue because um, he wants to be a uh, rad tech, and uh, he may go on to be, uh, he's talking about going on to be a medical doctor, and I'm, you know, and I'm like, there's a possibility there. With most kids, they go, oh, I want to be a doctor, and I'm like, oh, you are too sweet. <laughs> we'll see. Talk to me in 10 years. You know, see if you're going to be the doctor, but Nathan, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get like, that might happen, but I, you know, one of the things I talked to him about was you need to have a real job. Um, uh, I don't want you to go to med school for you know however long and then decide, well, I don't want to, do, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. And now you got nothing basically, and so go get a real job. And so he's going to be a rad tech, which means that um, he does X-rays and MRIs and and all of that kind of stuff. So he goes to Bellevue to do this, and there's this whole series of things that, that's been happening with him. When he went over to Bellevue. Um, actually, Bobby and he went over to look for apartments. And so we'd been, we'd been looking up apartments. It's really expensive, expensive over there. And so he found some apartments that are kind of like um, dorm rooms. Uh, they're really kind of interesting. They got kind of a common kitchen. And, and then you have like a, you know, in your, in your room, you got your room and you got a bathroom and it doesn't even have a sink in the bathroom. You know, there's a sink out in your, in your room. There's a place for a microwave and all that kind of stuff. So it's a little dink place. And so he wants one of those places because he wants to keep the cost down. So we're paying for it, but he wants to keep the cost down. That's a, what kind of kid is that? It's like, whose child is that? You know, that, that doesn't come from my genes. I don't know. You know, the whole homework thing, I never did homework. In any case, um, he, want, he wants that. So they get over there and uh, Bobby goes, well, let's, you know, just, let's just go look at a couple of places. So they go and look at these places and um, he wants it in this one building. And so they get in there and they're talking to the lady that runs this stuff. And she goes, well, we don't really have anything there, but we've got this other building that maybe you could do it in. And it just wasn't what, what he wanted. And so they're having this conversation. And then somewhere in the conversation, she goes, wait a minute, when are you coming? And so he tells him the date that he uh, tells her the date that he's going to move over, and she goes, "Well, I'm not really supposed to tell you this, but we're about to evict a guy, and actually, he's going to be out, and the room's going to be fixed by the time that you get back." And so when they evicted the guy, they replaced the shower, they uh, repainted the room, they replaced the cabinets. He got a new room when he got there. Okay, and so he gets a new room, and I'm just like, "Are you kidding me?" And so he gets that place. So they go over to, um, we're going to go move them over. And Bobby and Nate went over there first um, because I was teaching on a Wednesday. And then um, I came down and one of the things that happened was they got in and there was no parking in the place. They have a parking garage under the apartment building, right? And so um, there was no parking um, because it was all taken up. Everybody had, had the places taken up. And so he had to park out on the street. The problem was it was okay from like seven to nine, seven at night till nine in the morning. But after nine in the morning, you got to move your car every two hours or they ticket you. And so that was going to be an issue. And so they get there and um, uh, did you guys ask about a parking place? Yeah, I can't remember how that happened. Anyway, a parking place came up, and, and uh, the lady goes, well, no, we don't have any parking places. And she's looking at a computer, and, wait a minute. 
Hey, one just opened up and it's a single parking place. The way they park over in Redmond, Washington in these places like this is they have what are called tandem parking places. So you park in, in a parking place and somebody parks behind you. And so you have to arrange with the person who's parked behind you to move their car at certain times so that you can get out or else you can't use your car. What he got was a single parking place all by himself and he didn't have to do any of that nonsense. And so this, this single parking place comes up and the lady goes, wow, that's really weird. That never happens. And once again, I'm just like, you're a brat for the kingdom of God, you little baby, you know? And so then he goes to school. So he gets to school and he's going to go into this program. And you have, there's requirements for the program. So you have to have certain classes and he's finishing up that before he starts the program in July. And one of the requirements is that you have 50 hours, volunteer hours, in a hospital. And so um, he doesn't have that. He's only 18 years old. And so he goes into the class and he finds out about this stuff. Second class he goes to, one of the ladies in the class walks up to him and goes, you know what? Um, I'm not going to be able to do all, uh, to do the program next year. There was some personal stuff that um, uh, she had to do uh, that was going to conflict with that. I'm not going to be able to do the program. And so since you're no longer competition, just want to tell you, I have the email uh, of the guy who runs the volunteer work at Harbor uh, Harborview Hospital in Seattle, which is where they're going to uh, do all their work when they get into the program. And she goes, I'll give you the guy's email and you can, you can write him and um, he'll probably get you in. And so she just walks up and gives it to him. So he writes the guy and the guy's like, yeah, I'm interested. You know, come on in. You know, and he sets up an interview. He goes, he goes to another hospital because he does, doesn't want to just assume that he's going to get that. He goes to the other hospital over Lake in Bellevue and they just want him. And so they're all excited that, you know, that he's come in and they're, um, but he says, I, I got an interview over at Harborview. And so I need to um, wait until I do that. And the lady there is like, yes, absolutely. You get, you get volunteer work at Harborview. That's big for your program. And so you go do that, honey. And um, if you don't get it, then you can come back here and I got a place for you. And so he goes over to Harborview. Does he get it? Yes, because he's a brat for the kingdom of God. And so he gets that, right? So he gets that and he, and he jumps through the hoops to do all this stuff. Um, uh, you got to be trained before you get in and you got to go and get shots and stuff like that. So he does all this stuff and um, he gets in there. He starts volunteering. The second, oh, one of the things that um, he wanted was he wanted to volunteer in uh, uh, the radiological department. Well, they didn't have volunteers in the radiological department until he applied to be a volunteer. And then they made up a position right before he applied. It's the one position that's in the radiological department. So did he get that? Yes, because he's a brat for the kingdom of God. That's why he got it. And so, you know, there he is. He's, he's in the radiological department. Now it's the second time and all, already everybody loves him. I don't know why, but he's a pretty good guy. Um, but they love him. And so um, they, uh, they come up to him and they start talking to him about the fact that there's going to be a position that opens up, a temp position, where um, they're going to pay somebody to do the job that he's doing. And they go, we want you to apply for it. And he goes, okay. Well, and they say, you need to turn in a resume. And he goes, well, and it's two ladies that are, that are working with him. And he goes, okay, well, who do I turn the resume into? And they go, us. <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean? Well, we're the ones that check the resumes. So you turn the resume into us. And so he turns the resume in. And so they, um, next time he comes in, they come, uh, they come up to him and they go, this is a lousy resume. This really stinks. You need to fix this. And he goes, well, what's wrong with it? And she, they go, you know, you're never going to get, even get looked at with this resume. And so we need to sit down and fix it. So that for the next hour, they sit down with him and fix his resume. The people who are going to look at the resume fix the resume for him. And so <laughs> they, fix a, they fix the resume and um, turn it in. And one of the things that they tell him is, you know, if we're able to pick you, then we don't have to do 50 interviews of all kinds of people. We can just take you and it's just going to make our life, life is easier. And so he goes in and he gets the interview and um, they, without telling him that he got it, um, told him that he got it. And so once again, a brat for... Yeah. Yeah, I know, but he's got it. They, uh, one of the girls came up to him and said, should we tell him? 
And she goes, and the other girl goes, no, don't tell him. I have to talk to HR first. So anyway, so any, anyway, what you have there, I'm, I'm just looking at what's happening with Nathan. And one of the things that um, has been uh, something that is just a part of his life is the fact that he loves the Lord and he does his best to do what God says. And what God does is he goes before the guy and he just blesses him. He blesses him more than God. God blesses him more than he blesses me. I can't believe this. I'm just like, seriously? You didn't have to. And, and I'm, I'm just waiting for the trial. There's got to be a trial in here somewhere, you know, where things go south on it. But God's just taking care of the guy. And again, it says in this passage, uh, um, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, and then I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. God still does that. He still does that. If you, if you live in a way um, where you're looking at God and you desire his will, above your own. Verses 17 through 20, um, you have this slow fade of the people of Israel. It says, if your heart turns away so that you don't hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess, go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. And, you know, when, when somebody's drawn away from the Lord, what happens is it doesn't start out in a huge way. People don't just walk out and do something like, you know, uh, uh, embezzle a company. It, it, it's not like they, they come along and, and take off with $100,000, People don't just walk up and, and, you know, one day and decide, you know what, today I think I'm going to commit adultery. You know, people just don't do that. There's a, there's a slow movement away from the Lord, and that's what God illustrates here. He talks about the fact that um, their hearts turn away from the Lord, that they're drawn away to other gods. In other words, God is replaced by others. Your heart turns away, is drawn away. Um, God is replaced by others, whatever those things are. And what it does is it brings death. He says, you shall surely perish. And in verse 19, he says, you have a choice. That's another one of those things that, that goes around pretty routinely in Christian circles. The idea that I don't have a choice, that everything, you know, that if I give my life to Jesus, then everything is just preordained and nothing I, I say or do matters. It's not true. I have a choice. Um, unbelievers have a choice. God puts them in the place where, the, where they can choose. And in this um, instance, in this passage, what God says to them is, I've set before you life and death, verse 19, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. You get to pick this. Which one do you want? And again, it's the same thing with us. We get to pick it. And as a matter of fact, I'm way more free after I became a Christian than I ever was before I was a Christian. Before I was a Christian, I was just bound up in sin and I just did naturally the things that I did. After I became a Christian, what happened was God opened my eyes to the spiritual side of everything. And now I still have the problem with sin. I'm still fleshy. But on the other hand, I have this, this um, open view to the things of the spirit and God convicts me and he works in my heart and I get to pick now. And so I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus, but there are times when I get fleshy. And every time that I've ever gotten fleshy, what, God, what, I, what I have seen is that God has come in before the fact and he's spoken to me and he's influenced me and he's tried to get me to turn. And what I did was I just picked what I wanted to. I just went the way that I wanted to. And um, after a while, I started getting sick of that. And I decided, you know what? When that fork in the road comes up next time, I think I'm going to pick what God wants me to do. I'm going to try that from now on. And I don't do it perfectly, but I have a choice. And um, so do all of you. You have a choice. And so we don't have to live the way that we used to live. We don't have to live the way that the world lives. We can choose the things that God has for us, and we can have life because of it. So love of God, a heart that hears his voice, a dependence upon him, we, um, we're to cling to him, that you may cling to him. Um, he's my life. He becomes your life, and he's the length of your days. 
And so that's chapter 30. Chapter 31, what you have is God passing the baton, basically, from Moses to Joshua. Let's go through and, and read it. Um, verse, uh, let's just start in verse one, we'll go. It says, then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. I'm starting to feel that way. <laughs> I get up in the morning coming down the stairs. It's like, oh, I have this whole thing with my, my left knee is messed up because of um, surgeries and football and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of times when I'm coming down the stairs, first thing in the morning, it's left leg first, keep it straight, bring the next leg down, left leg first, keep it straight, bring the, bring the next day. I can no longer come out and go in or go out and come in. You know, it's, couldn't run a park, across a parking lot anymore. In any case, Moses is 120. I'm only 58. <laughs> you know? And he's like that. It says, also the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself crosses over bef uh, before you. He will destroy the, these nations from before you and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites and their land, when he destroyed them. The Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment uh, which I have commanded you. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And so Moses um, is passing the baton. You guys know where that come from, comes from, passing the baton? It's, it's from sports. It's from um, uh, track. And so I used to run uh, the mile relay. And so I was, uh, I was the anchor leg for the mile relay. And um, what would happen is you ran one lap. And when you got done with one lap, you watch the Olympics. They have batons in their hands. And there's this, this section that you have to run in. And you have to match speed. You have to match your arms. And then you pass the baton. You slap it into their hand. And they, and they grab it. And then they take off. And they run. And so it's a, it's a big fat deal that you practice that, that you, that you get this right um, because if you do it too early, if you're not in, in the boundary that's set up for passing the baton, um, you have a foul and your race is, is nullified at that point. If you do it too late, it's the same thing. You have a foul and the race is nullified. If you drop the baton, the race isn't nullified. You have to go pick the baton up and you've already lost anyway because these guys are so stinking fast. And so passing the baton is a big fat deal. It needs to be done right. It needs to be done well. And that's what Moses is doing with um, the people of Israel. Um, Moses is doing with Joshua. And Moses is doing with um, the tribe of Levi. Um, Moses brings them to the border. Um, but he's not going to take it in. He brings them to the border. He's not going to take it in. You know what Moses represents? The law. The law will bring you to the border of the promised land, but the law can never take you in. You know who takes them in? It's Joshua. You know what Joshua is? You know what the translation of Joshua is in the New Testament? The name? It's Jesus. So Joshua has the same name as Jesus. It's Jesus who takes you into the land. It's never the law. And so the law can bring me to the point where I recognize that I need something, where I can I recognize that I'm fallen, I recognize that I'm messed up. The law can bring me to the point where I fall to my knees. But it's Jesus that comes along and picks me up and places his spirit within me and begins moving me into a place where I have victory, where I finally win. And that's, that's what's happening in this instance. And so when Moses is talking to Israel... In these first six verses, um, he um, talks to them about specifically being strong and courageous. Be strong, he says in verse six, and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them for the Lord your God. He's the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Up in um, verse two, um, what Moses said to these people is God is crossing over with you. And in verses four and five, he says, God is gonna fight for you. The Lord will do to them as he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites in their land, when he destroyed them. The Lord will give them over to you that you, that you may do to them according to every commandment which I have commanded, to, uh, commanded you. And then finally, when you get to verse 6, he talks about the fact that God is with you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. And again, that is something that, that crosses straight over into our walk with God. 
when I'm looking at the things that God calls me to, when I'm looking at the places that God wants me to go, when I'm looking at the things that God wants me to do, when I'm looking at those um, obstacles in my life that are keeping me from the things that God has for me, those are battles. And what God promises is that he goes before me in battle. He's, he's with me as I'm going in. He goes before me. It's like he's clearing out the enemy. And he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. And it's something that I need to keep in mind all the time. It's not my fight. It's God's fight. And so the changes that God wants to make in me are changes that God is going to be doing the making of. And I need to always keep that in mind. Otherwise, what ends up happening is I'm just doing exactly the same thing that I was doing when I was in the world. When I was in the world, I wanted to change things. And sometimes I would for a month or two months or maybe three months, but it was never for a long period of time. And then after I became a Christian, I realized um, finally that it wasn't me that was supposed to be making the changes. It was God that was supposed to be doing it. And so God is the one who's with me. God is the one who fights for me. And he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. I have a problem in that I have a tendency to walk away. God doesn't have that problem ever with me. He never walks away. And so something that's really cool that God said to Israel, and it's cool because he says the same thing to us, be strong and courageous. So being strong and courageous is exactly the opposite of being wimpy and whiny and fearful, right? I'm supposed to be strong and courageous. I need strength because there are going to be times when um, opposition is going to come up again, uh, come up against me. That's a tautology of all things. Opposition is going to come up against me, but I'm going to have opposition. Um, there are going to be times when people are not going to like the things that I'm doing because I'm because I'm honoring Christ, because I'm walking with Him, and I'm going to have to be strong. I'm going to be have to have to be somebody that um, when the waves of opposition come up against me, they kind of just break on me like I'm a rock. I'm not going to move. That's how you need to be. You need to be a rock. You're not going to move. There, there are times when I have just ticked people off no end because they will come up to me, they will want me to do something and I've determined that it's an ungodly thing or it's unprincipled or it has a lack of integrity and they want me to do it and they come up and they try to force me to and I get this look on my face and they just get ticked off because I'm not moving and they don't like it. And when you're in a position like that, you have to be strong. And you have to be courageous, too. You have to be somebody who's not afraid of anybody. Um, you know, Jesus talked about fear. And he said, if you're going to be afraid of people, he, 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 well, this is in Matthew chapter 10. He said, if you're going to be afraid of people, don't be afraid of people who can kill your body. And that's all that they can do. If you want to be afraid of somebody, be afraid of somebody who can kill your body and throw your soul in hell. That's who you need to be afraid of. But then he goes on and says, better yet, you need to be in love with him because he loves you. And that's where Jesus talks about every hair on your head is numbered and that Jesus, that God loves you more than he loves the birds of the air and, and that kind of thing. That's in Matthew chapter 10. And so I need to be courageous. You know, um, in the book of Daniel, you have uh, Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it's a great story of courage in the face of radical opposition because what Nebuchadnezzar wanted those guys to do was bow the knee before a big fat idol. It was a hundred foot tall statue of him. And they wanted, and he wanted them to bow before it when the music started playing. And they said, no, we're not going to do it. He said, you don't do it. I'm going to throw you into a, a, a furnace of fire. And they said, you throw us into the furnace of fire, it doesn't matter. God can deliver us from that furnace of fire. And then they said this, and if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow before you. They were courageous. They didn't care. And the reason is because, the reason they weren't worried about what Nebuchadnezzar said is because they were worried about what the Lord would say. And that's where you get your courage from. I want to I be somebody who's more worried about what Jesus says about me than what anybody else would say about me. And if you live your life that way, then you can make stands and you can live with integrity and people will slam you and trash your name. They did it with Jesus. They did it with the apostles. 
They can, they can trash you, they can, they, can, they can slam your name, they can, they, can, they can try to wipe you off the map politically or, you know, or relationally in your family and that kind of stuff. But you know that what you're doing is you're standing for what's right in the situation. And that's what we need to have. You need to be courageous, be strong and be courageous. Otherwise, you're, you're just going to wimp out. And so, um, act, and, and again, when we're looking at the, the strength that we have, it's because God's with us. Verse 7, the Moses, Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel. Same thing that he said to Israel. Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And so God tells him, be strong and courageous once again. And then he tells him in verse 7, God's going to use you to bless these people. Um, in verse 8, it says, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. So the same message he gives to Israel is the same message that he gives to Joshua, who's the leader of Israel. So the same message I'm giving it to you is the same message that God gives to me. I need to be strong and courageous. I need to understand that God is going to use me in situations. He's going to use you too in situations with other people. And he's the one who goes before you. He's the one who's going to be with you. He's the one who's never going to leave you nor forsake you. And so you're not to be afraid. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Way too much fear in Christians' lives. Way too much. Fear of men, not fear of the Lord. You fear the Lord, you don't have to fear men. You bow your knee before God, you don't have to bow your knee before anyone. And so, uh, again, it's, it's something to keep in mind. Then he begins talking to the Levites. In verse 9, he says, So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women, little ones, the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, and that their children, who have not known it, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross over the Jordan, uh, cross the Jordan to possess. And so God talks to these people um, about the law, specifically to the priest, and he gives it to them to be put into the Ark of the Covenant. You remember that in the Ark of the Covenant, there was the uh, Book of the Law. There was the Ten Tablets. What else was in there? You guys know? Moses' rod that budded. One more thing. The manna. A pot of manna was in there. Later on, there was... Um, uh, 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 it came from the Philistines. Later on, they put inside what were what were called golden hemorrhoids. <laughs> God had cursed the Philistines, and the Philistines, in, uh, as an offering, made these golden hemorrhoids. What does that look like? But anyway, that was put put in the Ark of the Covenant too, and so that's that's what went in the Ark of the Covenant. And this is the book of the law that's going there. And it was to be read every seven years at the Feast of Tabernacles on the year of release. What the year of release was, was um, if you sold yourself into slavery, they had, they had their, their calendars divided up into seven-year periods. And so if I sold myself as an indentured servant, that's what slavery was. I'm, I'm too poor to live, and so I need somebody to take care of me. I can hire myself out as a servant and live in somebody's household for up to seven years. And at the end of seven years, they would have to pay me my wages and and uh, I would be able to go free. That's the year of release. I could do that at the beginning of the seven-year period, or I could do that three years into the seven-year period. But at the end of that seven-year period, that was the year of release, and that's when the book of the law was, was to be read to these people. And the reason for that is because the book of the law is something that God gives to these people to free them. And it's a symbol of the fact that the word of God frees me from my old life. The word of God frees me from slavery to sin. The word of God frees me to do the things that God's called me to do. And uh, so you have that. Verse uh, 14, um, I, I want to read this real quick. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. 
Call Joshua and present yourself in the tabernacle of meeting that I may inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting. Now the Lord appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud and the pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, you will rest with your fathers and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land um, where they go to be among them. And they will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger, anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us. And I will surely hide my face in that day, because of all the evil which they have done, in that they have turned to other gods." Now, therefore, write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. When I've brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I've swore to their fathers, and they've eaten and filled themselves and grow fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. Then it shall be, when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify against them as a witness, for it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants, for I know the inclination of their behavior today, even before I have brought them to the land which I swore to give them. Therefore Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. Then he inaugurated, this is talking about God, then he inaugurated Joshua the son of Nun and said, be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them, and I will be with you. And so it was when Moses had completing writing the, book, the words of this law in a book, when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who, uh, before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, um, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, take this book of the law and put it inside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. And so in this passage, Joshua's ordained now. So what God, what Moses had done was he'd gone before the people and said, you know, we're, you, we've ratified the covenant. You need to be strong. You need to be courageous. You need to trust in God. He turns to, Mo, to Joshua, strong, be courageous. You need to trust God. He's not going to leave you nor forsake you. Turns to the Levites and says, this book of the law, every seven years, guys, get it out. Make sure everybody hears what the law has to say. And then he takes Joshua and Moses and he brings them to the tabernacle and the pillar of cloud comes down over the tabernacle. The same thing that always happened with Moses. They walk into the tabernacle, they disappear inside there and they have a one-on-one -on -one with God. And so the th same thing that happened with, with Moses is what happens with Joshua. God is letting the whole, the whole nation know that Joshua is his chosen man at this point. He's passing the baton. And when he gets in there, um, Joshua gets to hear um, the future once again. God speaks to Joshua and Moses in, in their presence, and Joshua gets all the information that Moses was given. And then God turns to Joshua in verse 23, and he says, be strong. This is straight from the Lord now. It's not just through Moses. Be strong and of good courage, and you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them, and I will be with you. You know, um, that's God ordaining Joshua, and this one matters. You know, when, uh, when Joshua looked at these events after the fact, when Moses took Joshua up before all the people of Israel and presented him as the guy who's going to be taking over, versus when Moses went with Joshua into the tabernacle of meeting, and was alone with God and Joshua, which one do you think that Joshua remembered the most? And what, he, what I would remember the most is God speaking out of that pillar of cloud, specifically to me. Moses told me I need to be, I need to be strong and of good courage. Moses told me that God was going to be with me. Moses told me that God would never leave me nor forsake me. Moses told me all that. It's a whole different game. It's a whole different animal when God's the one who's doing it. And that's the, that, this is the one that matters. Anytime anybody's ordained around here, you know, what, you know what I do when I ordain people? I write a little certificate. I have a certificate, I have ordination certificates, and I take the ordination certificate, and at the bottom I sign it, and then I hand it to them. That's not ordination. Um, or, ordination is when God puts his hand on a man, when God puts his hand on a woman. 
and it's obvious that God's going to use them. The, all the certificate is, is, a, is like a legal thing saying that they have the right legally from our 501c3 to do the stuff that a pastor is supposed to be able to do. That's all that is. It's just a legal thing. What it actually is, is a recognition of the hand of God on a person. And that's what we have here. The, the, um, the ordination of Moses, where he stands before all the people and says, this is the guy doesn't mean anything if God doesn't in the tabernacle of meeting from the pillar of cloud say, you're my guy. And that's one of those things that we need to keep in mind um, when we're looking at ministry. I want to be led by the Lord. I want, to, I want God to be the one who is ordaining me. I want, to be, I want God to be the one who's commissioning me. I want God to be the one who's sending me. I want God to be the one who's telling me what to do. I want God to be the one. And when it's like that, man, it's just sweet, just really sweet. And so um, your ministry before God is not a job. Your ministry before God is something that, that God has designed you for and that God equips you for and that God causes you to be in, able to endure through and that God empowers you for. And uh, again, you need, you need to keep that in mind. And most of that stuff does not take place because I recognize you. You know, I'm just a guy. Most of that stuff is going to take place because you've spent time in the tabernacle of meeting, that place where you get, uh, where you're alone with God and God speaks to your heart and shows you the way that you're supposed to go. And God will do exactly the same kind of things. He'll say to you, you need to be strong. You need to be courageous. I'm with you. I'm going to go before you. And I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. It's a, it's a good thing to hear from the mouth of God. So let's end it there. Let me bless you guys and get you out of here. Jesus, again, we thank you for your word. Um, God, we thank you for um, the, um, just the tightness that you want to have with us. We thank you for the, for the relational um, aspect of our walk with you and for the fact that you care about us and that you want to be with us. Lord, we thank you for the fact that we've got a choice in the matter, that um, we can choose life. We can choose to follow after you. We can, uh, we can choose to walk with you. I'm not a slave anymore. Um, I, I, I have a free will, and I can do what needs to be done. Um, but, Lord, you don't just leave it to that. You empower us. Um, you come beside us. You walk with us, and you have your hand on us. God, we just pray that this week, the rest of this week, that that is exactly how our life would be going, that you would have your hand on us, that you would be guiding us through the day, um, that you would be going before us and making our paths straight, that you would be opening up opportunities for us, uh, whether it's to for, for your, the blessing of you in our life or whether it's to be a blessing in somebody else's life. Lord, we want you to be the one who leads. And God, we want to be people who hear from you. Help us to have ears that are open to your, uh, to your call, to your voice, Lord. And, um, Lord, just a heart that wants to spend time with you. And we just give you our, our, our hearts. We give you our, our lives. Um, we give you our week. And I pray that you would bless it, Lord, and that you do this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.